Ladies and gentlemen, can I just ask you to uh, take your seats? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking time uh, this afternoon to come to our event, joint event between the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy and the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Centre. Ladies and gentlemen, the war in Ukraine is probably the most brutal, unprovoked, unjustified and illegal aggression that we have seen in our lifetime. No one knows when this war will end, except possibly Putin himself, who can end it at any time. But what we need to do is start thinking ahead. We may not be at the end of the war, but certainly it looks like we are at the beginning of the end. The question thus arises after this war ends is that who is going to pay for all of this damage? There are a number of estimates in terms of the monetary cost of this damage, and they range from $349 billion to over $1 trillion. So who will pay for this? Are US, European, and other taxpayers expected to pay for this? Or can we have Russia pay reparations for the damage that they have done? The New Lines Institute has worked very hard with our colleagues to develop this model to ensure that Russia pays for reparations. And the reason why we had to put this model together is because the international system will be unable to deliver. Now, what do I mean by this? Let me give you an example. Iraq paid Kuwait $52 billion in reparations. And in fact, the final payment for that was made just last year in 2022. But that was only after Iraq was comprehensively defeated by an international coalition. Iraq was occupied by that coalition, and it was then mandated by the Security Council. Now, none of these three things are going to happen in the case of Russia. Russia will not be defeated by an international coalition. It will not be occupied, and the Security Council will clearly not mandate this. So alternative models have to be developed to ensure that Russia pays for this. And this is what exactly what the multilateral asset transfer model does. It makes sure that Russia will pay reparations and the, and the burden is not on taxpayers. So this model, which is completely within the, legal current, the current legal framework, has been developed with a number of scholars. And we have a, we have a few of them here today. And on my left is a chief author, Yulia Siskina. She's a chief author of this report. She is currently legal counsel at Razom. She's also at Quinn Emanuel Arkaha and Sullivan. She has spent time at the World Bank and the Department of Justice and has investigated and prosecuted financial crimes. She's also a well-published scholar. Online, who is joining us from California, is Professor Philip Zeloko, who is a chief advisor to this report and one of the key architects behind this model. You may have seen his seminal piece in Foreign Affairs, in which he presents this in a very comprehensive fashion. He is currently a professor of history at the University of Virginia, but he also has under his belt over four decades of government experience over five administrations. He has held positions in the White House, the State Department, and the Pentagon. And his most recent position was Chief Legal Counsel at the State Department under Secretary Condoleezza Rice. He also served as Executive Director of the 9-11 Commission. And on my far left, we have, on your far right, we have Ambassador John Herbst. He is currently the director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Centre. He also has extensive experience in government, over 31 years as a Foreign Service officer. He served as a US ambassador to Ukraine and Uzbekistan. He is a recipient of the Presidential Distinguished Service Award, the Secretary of State 
uh, Career Achievement Award and the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award. So we have a very distinguished panel that brings immense expertise to this area. And I want to start off by first passing the floor on to Yulia, who will give an overview in terms of how this model works and what the, the main concept is behind it. So with that, pass it on to Yulia. The floor is yours. Thank you, Azim. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I will start with the statement that for Russia to pay the damage that it has caused is not just the ethical and moral position. There is also a legal basis for it that is grounded in the principle of international state responsibility. So I'll be beginning with an overview of the international law basis for this proposal. The basic idea, the framework, is moving from the sanctions paradigm and into the countermeasures paradigm. So what do I mean by that? Sanctions and countermeasures are essentially two distinct paradigms that are related but used for different and distinct purposes. Sanctions, on the one hand, are essentially used during times of relative peace. It's a peacetime paradigm. The idea is to put some sanctions on a country that has been misbehaving, such as asset freezes or travel bans, and uh, wait until this country gives in and then decides to negotiate, and then a listing of these san sanctions can occur. However, as we've seen, sanctions are not enough for Russia to call off its war, much less compensate Ukraine, as we've seen this for the past year and a half. It's no longer a realistic paradigm to be in, but we're sort of still stuck in it, and we're a little bit confused. We're thinking, we've put all of these sanctions on Russia. It's been unprecedented. But not only has it not called off the war, it's doubled down. So the sanctions phase has run its course. It's time to be moving on to what we call the next phase under international law is called the doctrine of countermeasures. The countermeasures have been codified by the UN International Law Commission's Articles on State Responsibility. And by definition, they are state acts that suspend customary international obligations that states typically owe to one another, such as not taking each other's money. However, uh, it, there are two main requirements for lawful countermeasures, among other ones that are laid out by the Articles on State Responsibility. The main ones are, though, the first one, it has to be a response to an unlawful act, and it has to be for a specific objective. Here, both of these conditions are met. First, the unlawful act is clear. There is no debate as to this. We have two United Nations General Assembly resolutions, the latest one of which was passed in November 2022, that specifically calls on member states to develop a uh, mechanism for reparations and compensation for Ukraine. We have an International Court of Justice judgment. There is zero debate as to uh, the unlawful act that has occurred. Second, the specific objective is also clear here. First of all, it is to end the war and it is to compensate Ukraine and have Russia pay the debt that Ukraine is owed. There is no debate again that compensation is owed to Ukraine. Countermeasures are, much like sanctions, a tool. It is a tool in the toolbox to restore international order and justice. So there is also a principle called third party countermeasures. Um, this is the idea that, okay, the Russia didn't necessarily attack the US or other countries that attacked Ukraine. So therefore, do other countries have standing to use countermeasures? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Under international law, Russia owes an obligation to the rest of the world. It owes an obligation to not breach customary international law, to not breach norms, and to not commit acts of aggression. It's committed crimes against humanity, and that is a duty that it has breached to all states. So. This proposal is uh, laid out in page 44 of the uh, report that you have in front of you. Um, it is a flow chart in case you don't have time or don't want to read through 44 pages of legal citations, but they are there if you, if you want them. Uh, the proposal essentially is lifting these ordinary international obligations as to Russian assets, first for the purpose of transferring them into domestic escrow accounts. So every country that has frozen Russian assets, like the US, like European countries, like the UK, first transfers them, consolidates and transfers them, and isolates them domestically. Then 
pending an international agreement as to the disbursement and distribution of these funds, they will then be transferred into a global fund for the purpose of compensating and restoring Ukraine. Um, this will have an, will necessarily have to have an element of transparency, of accountability, of process, and it will need collaboration among countries that are all holding these state assets worldwide. So, and then after that, uh, the immunity that is typically owed to these state assets, and not the same, and not the assets themselves, importantly, will be restored once Russia comes into suitable compliance with its international obligations, once its debts are paid and fulfilled. So instead of staying in sanctions and waiting for some kind of deal that will still necessarily need to include compensation to Ukraine, we need to put the money that Russia owes to work now. Because we've, as we have seen and as it has been proven, Russia is not willing to step up and pay. In this unique situation, essentially, Russia left the duty to compensate in the hands of law-abiding states like the, Uni like the United States and like other countries around the world. We need to be showing it that that was a grave and fatal mistake for it to make. Russia's consent or willingness is also not required and not necessary for this proposal to happen. There has actually never been a countermeasure where the target state has consented that is counter to the idea of countermeasures. Uh, the compensation of victims cannot be left to the, to the consent of the country that violated their rights and injured them in the first place. That is a miscarriage of justice, and it essentially privileges the aggressor's rights over the rights of the victims. If these reserves sit there, immobilized, while Ukraine is destroyed, that is shattering international law. It is not upholding it and it is not respecting it. So I also want to make the distinction between judicial versus executive acts of state. This is an element that also plays into this proposal. Countermeasures are an extrajudicial process under legitimately domestically lawful acts of state, meaning executive authority. They do not involve the courts or adjudication or litigation or in development of any kind of special tribunal. Transferring assets with executive action means that sovereign immunity laws are not triggered. Sovereign immunity is a doctrine that uh, essentially states that a sovereign state is immune from civil or criminal suit against it. But we're not talking about lawsuits. We're not talking about adjudicative action. We are talking about executive acts such as, for example, uh, in the United States under the Emergency Economic Powers Act, which authorizes the US president to transfer the assets that uh, are currently within the jurisdiction of the US. Foreign policy is uh, um, typically left and reserved for the executive and legislative branches due to the separation of powers. Um, there's well-developed United States case law on this. It, this is also true for most other Western legal systems, British legal systems, and uh, many legal systems in the EU. So these reserves are frozen. Russia can't make use of them. And there is no realistic scenario in which this money is going back to Russia while Ukraine sits there destroyed and continues to suffer destruction. The, f the idea that this would somehow destroy international law is frankly and justly unfounded. The precedential value and the risks of not standing up for inter international order with respect to holding aggressors accountable, supporting victims of aggression, maintaining international community after an act with pervasive toxic consequences has occurred outweighs any other potential risks. Not only is this a legal way forward, it is the legal way forward that maintains and upholds international law. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Julia. Um, uh, let me just bring in Philip, but uh, Julia, you gave a very, very comprehensive overview that sanctions have been ineffective. You know, initially when this war started, we all anticipated that the sanctions were extremely effective, but it seems that Russia has managed to um, uh, ride those out. And um, uh, Russia will never give compensation itself simply because that will be admission of guilt. And so we cannot ever see uh, Russia kind of accepting any sort of responsibility for this. You also mentioned clearly that there's extremely well-developed case law 
around this. And so with that, I would just like to bring in Philip, who's joining us online. Uh, Philip, you know, we've, we've had a discussion around this uh, quite considerably and quite extensively, but there seems to be, despite the overwhelming evidence that this is completely legal, it's completely doable, and it's, as, as Julia says, it is the legal way forward, there still seems to be a, a lot of pushback um, uh, from various people uh, in the legal community and in the administration that, well, look, this has never been done before. It will set a bad precedent. It will ensure that people withdraw their money from the United States and um, uh, uh, deter investment into the US uh, and, and essentially just be a bad uh, precedent. So how, how do you respond to that? Yeah, the, um, a lot of the legal reactions to this at first were because they were all inside the law of sanctions. And so when you hear people say that the EU sanctions directive doesn't permit this, that's actually correct. Um, Yulia has explained very well that actually the law of sanctions is one body of law. Countermeasures are different. They're just fundamentally different. Basically, under sanctions, you, uh, you can immobilize stuff, but you don't touch it because you, you have these obligations. Countermeasures, you suspend those obligations so that you can then... Um, go after their property because they, the other side has done so much damage. The countermeasure is lawful if the other side has been violating core tenets of international law. So what's going on here? What's really going on here, the first thing I want to emphasize is there is a, a general fashion among a lot of people in international law and international law academia that increasingly wants to write the whole law of state countermeasures out of international law. Well, they, the, the position they take when you drill down is, well, you can't do anything to Russia without Russia's consent. I can't stress this strongly enough, that the core premise of the opposition to this move is boils down when you drill in to you can't do this without Russia's consent. You see, uh, the doctrine of sovereign immunity only applies to foreign court action. There's really no question that one sovereign has the power to take the property of another sovereign. And uh, ordinarily, that other sovereign would then be able to claim compensation for the taking of their property. And in this case, the lawful defense to that claim is the outlaw behavior of the person whose property has been taken. So then if there's no real doubt about the power to do this, then they boil down to the argument of, well, Russia hasn't consented. But as Yulia points out, and this is very interesting, their argument is to uphold the rule of law, we have to, Russia has to consent. Yet if you do that, then you say that the victims can never be compensated unless the person who hurt them agrees that the aggressor has to consent to the compensation of the victims. So then you should reflect for a moment on really, and that that's the principle that would strengthen international law. In fact, that's the principle that, in our view, would shatter international law. And of course, as Yulia points out, uh, countermeasures have in the past have never had the consent of the target state. But it's really important to understand uh, this core premise of the opposition, because what's really going on here is a school of international lawyers who are fearful of the abuse of countermeasures by powerful states. This is an academic trend that doesn't like powerful states, wants to react against that. Um, there is a certain, uh, uh, there is a basis for this concern in that it's the same reason people are always concerned that any form of law enforcement can be abused because law enforcement implies some exertion of power against lawbreakers. So then the problem in this case is when you uphold that right of consent, you um, not only do you uh, privilege the, uh, the victims, but in a way you eliminate the law enforcement altogether, um, and that's the, that's the core. The, what they would prefer instead is to take the case to the International Court of Justice and see if the International Court of Justice would adjudicate this. Now, there, the, that, is a, that is one possible strategy. It has four problems. One, it's very slow. So it typically, this could take seven to ten years before you could even get a judgment. Uh, two, it's very uncertain. 
um, for all sorts of reasons, including jurisdictional reasons, the court might find it's really unable to act. In fact, that's what happened when Georgia sued Russia in the International Court of Justice more than 10 years ago. After years of litigation, it fizzled out on jurisdictional arguments. Three, it's unreliable. It's unreliable because at the end of the day, 10 years from now, the court could hand down its judgment and then Russia refuses to pay. And then what do you do? And then finally, it's, uh, it's an entirely claims-driven process. Uh, the courts are, don't have the flexibility to do policy-driven assistance that can be proactive in rebuilding infrastructure, demining, and other things for which there isn't necessarily a formal claims process. So the ICJ, the ICJ alternative is inferior then to state countermeasures in this case. The third uh, point I'd like to make, first was about consent, second about the ICJ alternative. The third one is about the slippery slope argument that, gee, if you adopt this countermeasures approach, couldn't this be used against the United States? Uh, um, and the answer actually is, well, uh, one, Russia is already using the doctrine of state countermeasures against us, and we've made no response. In April, Russia adopted a, a presidential decree invoking the doctrine of state countermeasures to say, well, gee, we can now take over without any due process the private companies operating in Russia if they're domiciled in states we deem unfriendly. And they proceeded to do that in April against a German and Finnish com German and Finnish companies, and they just did this a week ago against French and Danish companies like Danone and Carlsberg, to which, by the way, the Western governments have made no reply at all. So it's the Russians have already launched the countermeasures, but where we want to carefully craft our countermeasures to target only Russian state assets, since there's no due process issue as to whether the Russian state is responsible for the Russian state. The Russian state uses the countermeasures to go after private property, which is patently unlawful, and then we don't and then we don't answer that. I think if you get into slippery slope cases and analyze them carefully, I think you'll see that, um, as a practical matter, they don't really pose much danger to the United States or European countries for a lot of reasons. There is uh, a fourth an argument about. Well, gee, wouldn't this hurt the financial system? If you confiscate the Russian money, won't that make people reluctant to put money in dollars and euros and yen and sterling? Well, one of the reasons that I did the essay in Foreign Affairs and another essay that appeared today in The Economist with Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, and Bob Zellick, former president of the World Bank, is to make it clear that actually we see no risk to the financial system at all from doing this especially if you're working with the holders of the other major reserve currencies. Uh, countries don't put their money in dollars because they like us. They put their money in dollars because they have to if they want to participate in the international economy. We can go into more detail about this if you're interested, but we, and by the way, other senior figures in Europe really uh, who have analyzed this actually don't see any risk to the financial system at all. And the, the, the fifth and final argument that we encounter most often, which is uh, the, in a way the easiest to dispense with of all, is that, gee, reparations, didn't that have a bad name? Uh, didn't we do that to Germany after World War I and wasn't that terrible? And there are really uh, two answers to this that are very easy to make. Uh, the first is that the first complaint about reparations after World War I is you're bankrupting the country that is the engine of European recovery. But in this case, taking the Russian assets won't bankrupt Russia. It has hundreds of billions of dollars in euros in unfrozen reserves that are still intact. And Russia is not the engine of European recovery. The other complaint about the Versailles settlement was that you were actually punishing the liberal democratic republic that had just overthrown the Wilhelmine monarchy. In other words, uh, what Keynes was so bitter about, for example, was that the German liberals had taken power. They were now running the Weimar Republic after the German Revolution of 1918. So it's as if Navalny had taken power in Russia. Russia then had installed a liberal democracy run by centrist leftists, and then you uh, have your reparations levied against them. Well, I think that scenario is not close to occurring in Russia. And even if, uh, and what would happen if that scenario did occur is Russia would still have plenty of money in its foreign exchange reserves, 
and you'd simply lift the sanctions and allow Russia to recover that way. So that's uh, so that that particular historical argument doesn't have a lot of weight. So the point is, I think Yulia has done a really good job of kind of laying down the basic case and approach. And what I've tried to do is kind of review uh, the principal arguments opponents have raised uh, a little bit neuralgically in the first months, and I think now they're kind of invested in those positions. But I think if you look at those uh, positions of the opponents, you'll see that actually they would destroy international law rather than uphold it. Thanks so much for that uh, very comprehensive uh, counter arguments and overview, Philip. So, so let me bring it to John. John, you, you, you've heard all the arguments now. You know, Yulia has made it very clear that this is not just a way, but the legal way. And you've heard from Philip how the likes of Larry Summers, Chief Secretary of Treasury, former pre and the president, former president of the World Bank, Robert Zellick, have said there is no risk to the financial system. And in fact, what's holding it back are just uh, lawyers. Um, who are not experienced in this and, uh, and, and in my words, uh, just a little bit timid. Um, uh, so as, a, as a, one of the most experienced diplomats, you know, with, uh, who understands the geopolitics of this better than anybody else, what would be the political cost if we were not to proceed on this basis? What would be the implications of this? I think to answer your question, I need to explain the context in which this conversation is taking place. The context is relatively simple, but not well understood. Uh, we have built, we the United States, in, in cooperation with our allies and partners, um, an extraordinary international system. Um, the Bretton Woods system that was put into place after World War II, and actually it's just called the Bretton Woods system. It includes the UN, it includes all the international financial institutions that started at that time, the IMF, the World Bank. It includes on the side the common market which became the European Union. And perhaps most important of all, it includes NATO. And these institutions collectively have done something unprecedented in history. They have, at least to this date, rid the world of great power conflict. That's especially important because two world wars in the 20th century killed close to 100 million people and destroyed countless wealth. And no mistake about it, alongside virulent disease, starvation, lots of a problem today, although the Russians are reviving that problem. Great power wars are, again, the great destroyers of people and wealth. Uh, it's not a coincidence that in 1950, after a period of substantial uh, economic growth going back at least 150, 200 years, uh, global poverty, uh, was the fate of 70% of the world's population. Today, that figure is like 9%. The absence of great power war is a very important factor in that, as is, of course, extraordinary economic, technological development, which, again, was empowered by having a framework of peace. Although, keep in mind, in this 70 year of no great power war, 70 plus years of no great power war. There's been plenty of war, but not two major powers going at it, which again, is particularly destructive. Now why am I telling you this? It's pretty simple. You now have two great powers, China and Russia, with their little, little pals, um, North Korea and Iran, that want to, quote unquote, revise the rules of this order, this international order. And China is a truly great power because it enjoys a real economy. Russia is a great power only because it has nuclear weapons. It's a pure nuclear rival to the United States. As we've learned in Ukraine, it's conventional military forces, forces a good bit less than we had thought, but still substantial. And while China is the greater threat long term, Russia is the greater threat near term 
because Putin is willing to take dangerous risk. He launched a war on Georgia. He's conducting a war on Ukraine, which has certain elements of great power war. At least you have one great power fighting. And were he to succeed in Ukraine, American prosperity, American security would be at risk. Why is that? The security structure we built in Europe at the end of the Cold War, excuse me, at the end of World War II, which sustained uh, peace throughout the Cold War, and of course the Soviet Union was a more formidable rival to the United States since Putin's Russia can be and is, uh, was the basis for that. And make no mistake about it, the people in this country who say we'll make America great by allowing Russia to succeed in aggression don't understand that Russia's coming for our bacon. And Putin has not hidden this. If you look at the two quote unquote draft treaties that Moscow sent to Washington and to Brussels in December of 2021 before the big invasion, you'll see that Putin has designs on the entire state structures, that all the nations that make up the former Soviet Union, which happens to include three NATO allies. So Putin's aggressive designs don't end on Ukraine's western border. They extend farther west into Eastern Europe. And if we don't stop Putin in Ukraine, we may well have to stop him in the Baltic states, which A, will be much more expensive, and B, will involve American lives. This is something that has not been clearly explained to the American public. The Biden administration deserves credit for producing an adequate response to the Kremlin challenge. And by the standards of the subpar American uh, foreign policy of this century, that's not a bad result. But in terms of the historical standards of American diplomatic practice, going back to the end of World War II, it's not good enough. Putin's Russia needs to be contained. It's that simple. And the place to contain it and to defeat it is in Ukraine. We are spending $55 billion a year, the last two years, between economic and military assistance. And if you look at that by itself, you say, wow, $55 billion. And the strategically challenged will say, we're giving all that money to save a country of no importance to us. Again, for those who are strategically challenged. If you understand the threat, then, well, $55 billion represents 6% of the U.S. defense budget. With that 50 excuse me, that 6% of the U.S. defense budget, the Ukrainian armed forces have destroyed roughly 50% of Moscow's conventional military capability. That's a very sound investment in American security. And again, just so we understand, this is also related to American prosperity. Europe was the incubator of the two great wars of the last century. Again, total deaths of 70 or 80 million people. Europe has been largely stable until Moscow went on the prowl. And again, we have to stop Moscow before that prowl goes beyond Ukraine. So how does that relate to this? Uh, you know, it's, it's truly a wonderful thing to work with this group of people. Zelico has pioneered a very smart idea, and Yulia and Azim have talked about why it's important, excuse me, how it would work, and how it would meet the specific economic needs that Ukraine faces now. And this relates to the big stuff I've just been talking about. Uh, in order to defeat Putin in Ukraine, which again is of vital interest to American security and prosperity, not only does Ukraine need the weapons that we are only dribbling out in an unsatisfactory manner, they also need to be economically sustainable. Uh, the Ukrainian GNP, as a result of the big Russian invasion, has created by about 29 or 30 uh, percent. Ukraine needs a uh, minimum of $3 billion a month, but more like $5 billion a month to sustain vital government services. Right now, those funds are coming in 
adequate numbers, especially from the United States, but also from Europe and the EU. But why in the world do we want to limit that economic sustenance to the countries which are, in fact, dealing with the aggressor, as opposed to the aggressor himself? And there's another factor here, too, because this is all about not just geopolitics, but politics. And again, you know, there are knuckleheads in this country who are saying that we don't have a stake in Ukraine and that we can't afford to provide this assistance to Ukraine. Those same folks, of course, have a pedigree. Uh, and when we've heard some of them raise their head, we point out that during the Great Depression, when the American economic circumstances were far worse than they are today, we managed to provide substantial aid to democracies in peril to Nazi Germany through our Lend-Lease program. And there are somewhat similar stakes today. Similar, not, not identical. But again, we see some problems in Congress. Uh, I don't think they're overwhelming, but they're nonetheless real, about continuing to provide the assistance we are providing to Ukraine. Military, but especially economic. Economic is more vulnerable in the political context that we are currently operating in. So if we have access to this money, the $300 billion of Russian assets, state assets, frozen in the international system, uh, that would ease the demands for our economic assistance, but also make it easier for us to provide that assistance in our current political world. And again, Philip, Yulia, Azim, and others, bolstered by the authority of people who've been at the top of the international economic system, Bob Zelik, uh, Larry Summers, and others, show us how to do it. So it's almost a no-brainer. All we need, although all is perhaps a bit of a, an understatement, all we need are decision makers of vision, not decision makers who look like bookkeepers narrowly looking at numbers in a ledger. With that, we tell the lawyers what we want. The lawyers pursue the arguments developed by Philip Yulia, and we're off to the races. The same instincts that have us dribbling out weapons to Ukraine have us wringing our hands over the potential legal problems or the ostensible economic damage that might come from pursuing this course. But again, those arguments on close examination don't stand up to the challenge of the moment. The challenge of the moment is that this wonderful international system, which again, in comparative terms, has enabled extraordinary uh, stability, security, and also prosperity, is under threat. And we can take these steps to ensure that that threat, threat is defeated. All it takes is a person of vision and resolve making the decision. Thanks. Thank you so much, John, for that uh, very sobering uh, analysis of the implications of this. Um, before I open up to questions, you know, I, I'd like to say that one of the things that, uh, you know, the arguments that are made against this is that it will set a very dangerous precedent. And uh, one thing I would like to point out, one of my kind of motivations behind this is that is, this is a precedent that we actually want to set. As I argue in my uh, most recent book, Authoritarian Century, which is uh, available online and in all good bookshops, by the way, is that the international system is simply not working as it should. We have a situation now in which we have a member of the Security Council, a nuclear power that has invaded its democratic neighbor. And we have a situation in which another member of the Security Council, also a nuclear power, threatening to invade its democratic neighbor, Taiwan. The situation, the international system is simply not operating. We need new models, we need new ways of thinking, new innovative thinking, and this will send the strongest possible message to even the implications of this will be quite profound. Make no mistake, the strongest message deterrent you can send to the CCP before they get involved in adventures in the likes of Taiwan is if you started using Russian assets as compensation. Chinese investment in the United States and elsewhere is exponentially more than Russian investment. And make no mistake, almost every member of the Politburo in China 
has their money in the West. None of them keep their money in China. They all make their money in China and they invest it in the West because they know exactly what happens when you fall foul of Xi Jinping and the, and, and the Communist Party. You very quietly disappear. And if you don't believe me, ask Jack Ma, ask Desmond Chum, ask Bo Xi Lai. The only crime was just being too successful. All of them keep their money in the West. They all like to send their children to the West for education. And this will be the strongest message possible that this will not stand. Adventures in Taiwan will not stand. The other argument that is made is that, look, we should not humiliate Putin. You know, this is something that we should not do. And this is an argument that is uh, forwarded by the likes of Macron and others um, uh, who are trying to negotiate some sort of deal, which I actually found quite distasteful because it denies the Ukrainians agency that to try to cut them out and try to come to some sort of agreement. But in fact, you know, one of the things I would, you know, I, I used to teach a class at the University of Chicago. And one of the things I used to tell my students is that if you're ever confused about a geopolitical situation, just look at what the neighbors are doing and how they're reacting. And that'll give you a very good understanding of what's actually going on. And a good example of this is, 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 is what happened during COVID. If you remember when the World Health Organization itself said that there's no human to human transfer and that Boris Johnson canceled flights from Wuhan and there was an outcry from, uh, from Beijing that this is anti-China and so on. But if you look at the regional countries, what were they doing? Every one of them had canceled flights and interaction with, with China, you know, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, even Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, because they know their neighbor, they know their neighborhood. In the same way, you see when Macron and others are trying to negotiate with Putin, all the countries in the region, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Czech, Poland, all of them are against this because they know their neighborhood. They know exactly what Putin is about and that any sort of agreement with him, any peace deal, is just going to be a temporary one and he will essentially um, uh, do the same thing again. So the implications of this uh, model are quite profound, but they're actually ne necessary at the same time. And with that, I'll open it up to questions to the floor. There is a mic that goes around. If you can just say your name and identify yourself at the same time. Uh, first question from Dr. Kamran Bukhari. Kamran Bukhari, <coughs> Eurasian Security and Prosperity at New Lines. Thank you so much, Azim, Yulia, and John, and Philip. Powerful arguments uh, and at the right moment. Let me give you another argument to demolish because it's also circulating uh, in, the, uh, in our public discourse. So there is an argument that if we press Putin, uh, Russia too hard, Russia could fall apart, Putin could be ousted, and then you would have chaos in a nuclear state. What I would love from any one of you or all of you, if you're, if you're interested, is to sort of deconstruct that argument through the lens of this uh, asset transfer, that that's not what's going to happen. Uh, would love your thoughts. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, um, uh, shall I take another few questions? Are there any other questions I can take at the same time? Yep. Anders Roslund, I would like to ask uh, the whole panel, how would you like to see this process going forward? How should it be done so that it can become reality? Thank you. What was your name, sir? Anders Roslund. Okay. So let me um, uh, direct the first question to John, since you have served in the region. Um, uh, so that's a very valid concern. The last thing we want is uh, Putin to collapse completely and Russia to break up. Surely that's something that nobody desires. So how do we, how do we counter that? Oh, uh, look, we have a very dangerous challenge right now, which is one of the world's two big nuclear powers is marauding in Ukraine, its second war, in Europe of the past 15 years with designs to go farther. That is a direct challenge which, if unaddressed, would lead to catastrophe. We need to stop it. The danger of Russia fracturing, not implausible, but also, frankly, not likely, is a second or third order danger compared to the one we're confronting. Generally speaking, if you look at those advocating this argument, 
They're the same ones who've been weak on Russian aggression since it began in Ukraine in 2014, or for that matter, in Georgia in 2008. If, if we give Ukraine everything it needs, militarily and economically, to defeat the Russians in Ukraine, chances are um, Putin's regime is not going to last too long. It's conceivable in that period there may be some loosening of central power in Russia. The notion, however, that the country would actually fracture has little historical basis. For those who know Russian history, in fact, there have been a loosening of central power when the country has been defeated in war. That happened after the Crimean War. It happened after the Russo-Japanese War. It happened spectacularly after World War I. You could argue it happened after the Cold War. But then it reconstituted itself. And that's the most likely scenario. But to say we have to let Putin continue his war of war crimes in Ukraine so that Russia does not fracture is both geopolitical and um, moral idiocy. Is that clear enough? Yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> and uh, the, the second question I'll, I'll, I'll direct to Philip from uh, Anders. So, Philip, you obviously are, are more experienced in the internal mechanisms of the government having f four decades of experience under your belt. So what is the road forward from here? What are the main obstacles? And uh, how do we move forward from here with this model? Uh, I, I'll just add on the point about uh, worrying about Russia collapse. Um, Russia has already written off these assets. Um, they, there's no scenario in which they expect to really get them back. Um, so... It, it certainly doesn't add any added weight to the strains already on Russia. The main concerns are the terrific strain on Ukraine right now. So uh, how, do you, how, do, how to do this? Uh, my view is actually um, there are some preliminary steps that ought to be done right now to begin um, um, moving the Russian assets into escrow accounts along the lines the report suggests. While uh, putting Russia on notice, we're going to do this and perhaps beginning by immediately starting to channel the uh, income that's being earned by this assets that have been turned to cash and are being actively managed by some of the clearing houses where most of the money is held. But the, so the first step is uh, put the Russians on notice. We're going to start doing this and get going, moving the money into escrow. Two, in parallel to that, begin building the international mechanisms that would actually receive and distribute the money. I would turn over to the international financial institutions led by the IMF and the World Bank, the job of designing international mechanisms that perform two large tasks. First is uh, with a large allocation of the assets, they should develop large programs of policy-driven assistance that can be deployed urgently um, through um, understandings with the Ukrainian government about how to de-risk the distribution of that money, and also to link that to the process of EU accession and the terms that will be associated with that process. So the first thing that mechanism needs to do is run an urgent, large-scale, policy-driven European recovery program centered on Ukraine. The second thing the mechanism needs to do that these institutions We, we lost him. I think if you can hear us, Philip, you're, you're, you're frozen. Philip, we, we seem to have lost the connection. And until he cuts back on, I'll, I'll pass it on to Yulia, and uh, she can respond to those. I just wanted to uh, fill in a little bit about these preliminary steps that uh, Philip Zelko just mentioned um, about moving the frozen Russian assets into escrow accounts. This is something that not only can be done now under especially U.S. authority, it should have been done yesterday. There is legal authority in the United States to already do this under the International Economic Emergency Powers Act, which enables the president to uh, under the original version, the 1977 version, to transfer assets into an escrow account. 
Uh, the main confusion with this in discourse has sometimes been, well, this doesn't allow the president to confiscate them, which is a slightly different legal term. Confiscation can happen, according to Congress, passing an amendment in 2001, under times of armed conflict or if there has been an attack on the United States, which arguably those conditions are not met here. However, the transfer can occur into those escrow accounts. And pending that transfer, then we can start building, as Philip mentioned, this uh, parallel international mechanism to start distributing those assets. So the United States can do this. The United States can and should show leadership. Um, and as we have heard, the other European countries especially will follow suit. It sets an important uh, pathway forward. And the United States is in a unique position to be able to seize on that opportunity. Thanks for that, Yulia. I'm not sure how much of that you got. Philip, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I heard all of that. It sounded like there was some glitch in my transmission, but I'm sure you heard enough. Thanks so much. Uh, so let me um, uh, take a final set of questions um, uh, before, we, before we wrap up. Once again, just say your name and your organization. Yeah, the young lady at the back there. Thank you. <coughs> Dorina from Razum. Could you please expand on um, the argument that it is strategically incorrect to be focusing on avoiding humiliating Putin and why that is counterproductive for the prevention of escalation? Thank you. Uh, one more here at the front from this young gentleman. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Calvin Wilder with the New Lines Institute. Um, I guess we touched on this actually a little bit with the last question, but I would just love to hear more about the disbursement process. Who would be responsible for dispersing these funds? What do you envision them exactly being used for? And I guess specifically if we're talking about this as reparations, uh, to what degree would Ukraine have direct oversight of the funds and what would their input be on the process? So, And thank you all so much. This has been very, very informative. Thanks so much for that, uh, Calvin. Um, uh, so the first question, I, I, I think, that once again, direct John, you know, uh, with the argument about humiliating Putin. Uh, the issue of Putin's humiliation has been, you might say, the principal argument for those who want to allow Russia to continue its war bordering on genocide in Ukraine. And the logic ultimately comes down to the successful uh, psychological operation that the Kremlin has conducted spooking at least some Western decision makers that if Russia cannot win a conventional war in Ukraine, it will use nuclear weapons. And this is a very sad development. I say that as a proud American diplomat or former diplomat. Uh, ever since the Soviet Union got the bomb, we've lived in an area of nuclear power competition. So this goes back over 70 years. And up until two years ago, you never heard a senior American official say publicly, when we were in a uh, standoff with another nuclear power, specifically the Soviet Union, over Berlin in 1961, Cuba in 62, or for that matter, the Berlin crisis a decade before that, that we can't do X, we can't do Y, because Russia might use nukes. This is diplomatic malpractice. The foundation of stability in the nuclear era is deterrence what in some cases has been called mutual assured destruction. That's based on the notion that we've got nukes too. So we don't let Putin's, again, massive psyops, that he will use nukes if he does not get his way, deter us from defending our interests. And this has been a factor in the crisis since Moscow began the big invasion. And so that's where you get this weasel words about, we can't humiliate Putin. Because he's that quote unquote rat in the corner who's going to lash out when he is challenged. Now we saw, we saw just in the last two, uh, six weeks, that the rat in the corner metaphor is nonsense. Putin was the rat in the corner, the corner being Moscow, as Pogosian was marching on Moscow. So what did the rat do? Did he lash out? No. He boarded a plane to get out of Dodge. 
right? He didn't do what Zelensky did. Zelensky said to, to Biden, send me weapons, not a plane. Putin, Putin, Putin took his plane out. So the rat's not quite so formidable as the PSYOPs presents. Would that policymakers in this town and elsewhere understood that. And keep in mind, this is also related, it's very important. Even before the Prigozhin episode, people of, you might say, greater strategic depth always asked, if in a crisis in Ukraine, meaning a failure of Russia's conventional forces, Putin gave the order to use tactical nukes, would the Russian military actually carry out that order? Because they understand that doing that risks nuclear destruction for Russia, too, because we have nukes. Uh, we saw in the Prigozhin episode that that question was a trenchant one, because one of Putin's problems as Prigozhin was marching on Moscow was that his military, his Rosgvardia, his presidential, his Praetorian Guard, and the various intelligence services were not conducting a serious military strike to stop Prigozhin. So again, those who talk about Putin's humiliation, therefore we have to let the Russian wolves devour Ukrainian innocence, because that's what they're doing when they make that argument, do not understand that we have nukes too, and the Russians get that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for that, John. Yulia, you want to add to that? Yes, I do want to add to that. Um, I completely um, agree with John, and I would also like to point out that factually, it, it's just not true, this humiliation argument. Uh, it's been shown that we're essentially playing two different games. Russia's playing the ch game of chicken, and we're playing the game of non-escalation. And the Ru Putin and Russian ethos is to back down from s shows of strength. And meanwhile, the US is trying not to escalate. So we're essentially giving Putin a blank check to do what he wants. And it has been shown, uh, there's been a consistent pattern that Putin has escalated when the United States and when, when other countries have shown moments of weakness. Uh, whenever there is a statement that comes out from the United States or another country is we're not sending so-and-so kind of weapons, we're not uh, giving an invitation to NATO, there is almost always an attack by Russia that follows. Um, this, is, this is consistent. Um, so the only way, I believe, is, uh, t is to show Putin strength, a united front and strength. That is the way to, that is actually the way to de-escalate. He understands. Um, uh, fi final word goes to Philip. A um, uh, question from Calvin, a very legitimate question. You know, the sums we are looking at here, uh, Philip, are obviously very, very large, and there's obviously going to be deep concern in terms of how those funds are used, how they're dispersed, how they're monitored, um, um, and how they're essentially uh, uh, verified. Um, uh, so what would, be the, what would be the vehicles and the mechanisms by which to do that? Think of three things, uh, three pillars. The first is the G7 has created a donors coordination platform to provide some uh, overall coordinated political guidance. And you can set up escrow accounts to receive the money for the use of the agency. Second pillar, the international financial institutions should design a plan to create today's version of the uh, Economic Cooperation Administration, the ECA, of the kind that we used to administer the European Recovery Program between 1948 and 1952. This later turned into the OECD. The, uh, you need to create an international entity that can run the policy-driven assistance process, the proactive process, but also oversee the claims uh, process, and then uh, you can get political guidance on how to do the asset allocation. The third pillar then is you'll need to create and work with the Ukrainian governments to create, both federal and state and local, some sort of appropriate Ukrainian intermediary that can de-risk the distribution of the money. Um, there's actually already been some work done on this. For example, if you needed an entity that could receive money on behalf of the Ukraine and manage that money and also blend it with private investments, 
uh, that requires a certain kind of entity rather than having the international organization have direct relationships with 30 different Ukrainian entities. Create some Ukrainian entity that functions as an intermediary. They've already been in negotiations with firms like BlackRock to create some kind of fund that can perform these functions and help de-risk the distribution of the money, given the kinds of guidelines for distribution that the international community will wisely establish. Thanks so much for that, Philip. I hope that answers uh, satisfactory your, your question. Before I wrap up, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say that there's uh, copies, plenty of copies of the report uh, outside, so please do make sure you take copies for yourself and your family members. Uh, so it makes very, very uh, good reading. And we've got copies of other New Lines reports as well, so please take as many as you can. And with that, I want to thank all of you for attending and to thank our stellar panel for taking the time out today um, uh, to give this presentation.